I remember we stopped trading. Uh, we became very much heads down on building out uh, this tech, which is, by the way, that period I remember was some of the most stressful of my life. Was it? <laughs> because, and you know, and it's one of those things as a founder, right? A first time founder, especially, is you kind of grossly underestimate how much time things take because you've yeah, never, yeah. for me, I've never done any of this before. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Quantopian Show. Uh, today, I'm very excited about our guest. It's Christina Chi, current uh, CEO and founder of Datavento, and previously uh, the founder and I believe CEO, right, Christina, of Domeyard. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here for various uh, personal reasons as well, because um, Domeyard and Quantopian go very far back, by the way. Um, our offices were across the street, literally across the street, like our buildings. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're that close to Boston. one another. I would drop by their office for lunch. Like that was kind of how, how close we were. Um, and this was, a, I would go back to their meetups and stuff like this was 10 plus years ago. So um, I, I look forward to diving into all of this because it, it almost seems like we were like the third generation. I don't know if this is fair, by the way, are we the third generation of quant kind of hedge funds? <laughs> um, but it was this generation of funds that um, if, if you counted, I guess, Ed Thorpe as like the first generation and then Ray Dalio and, you know, those types of people as second generation, uh, you know, the, what is it, 80s, like 90s, 2000s, right? And then if you count, I don't know if we would be the third or fourth generation, <laughs> um, but we were like this new generation of unique funds that were started by people who, um, you know, kind of just uh, regular people, I guess. Um, and we raised venture capital funding. You know, we took a path that was so, I guess, unique and, um, uh, you know, hopefully have paved the way, I think, for a lot of other funds now to, you know, come around as well as uh, other types of innovations in the industry, right? Whether they're back testing platforms, trading platforms, et cetera. Uh, and so, yeah, I was just really excited to be here, especially, and um, to talk to Foss again. So thank you for, for doing this. <laughs> uh, that's absolutely my pleasure. Um, yeah, I feel like that block uh, in Boston was like this bizarre hotbed of, of um, new technology and new innovation in, uh, in hedge funds uh, 10 years ago. So it's really great to see you again. Um, and uh, there's a whole bunch of things you just mentioned, actually, that I'm really curious to dive into. But I always like to start with motivation um, and ask what I always think is like the big important question for founders, which is, why did you start Dome Yard? Yeah, um, motivation wise, I guess it's a, that's a really great question, right? Um, I think first there's like almost this existential thing that I always have when I think about. Um, so just to give everyone a preview of what happened first off, Dome Yard failed about 10 years later. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, and I, I don't like to sugarcoat things. I don't like to be like, oh, we pivoted or we, you know, it's kind of like, yes, our original goal for the company did not work out. And so I think it's fair to still call it a failure in a sense. But beyond that, I would say, um, you know, in terms of just, you know, do you have the motivation to even do something right? Uh, that That's a great, that's a fair point. That actually is a great question. Um, and at that time, I think uh, it's interesting um, I started Domeyard because I actually, so I was in college, so this was like a, we were college-based, like, you know, started the firm um, straight out of school. We were very young, like 21, 22, like around that age. Um, and uh, so the reason why was actually because, at least for me, I, I did have two co-founders, so our stories were slightly different. For my story, it was because um, I couldn't get a job, <laughs> which is as embarrassing as it sounds, it, you know, that was the case, right? Um, I Yes, I did go to a really great school, I went to MIT, but then beyond that, it's like, like, okay, I was struggling in school. Um, I had a, I did have an internship, um, you know, in sales and trading, but then after the summer was over, I did not get the return offer because I was a bad intern. <laughs> um, and so was that me, like a banking job? You were more... trying to like break into investment or you said sales and trading uh, position? I was trying to just break into finance in general um, and to so get a job. <laughs> what, what, what had you like on fire for finance like why did you want to break into that industry um oh that's also because again 
uh, I hate to say it's a string of failures, but kind of it was because, um, so at MIT, I tried to major in biology first because I got a five on AP bio in high school. So this is going all the way back. Yeah. <laughs> you want to go really far back. Yeah, yeah we're getting to root causes tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, um, then I did that. I got a C, I think a C or C minus in the intro, intro bio class at MIT. Just give you a sense. <laughs> I got a five on the high school, you know, I got a great score, but that's like the top score on the, the high school uh, exam. And then go to MIT and I get like the lowest score and not the lowest in the class, but one of the, you know, amongst probably the lower part of the the spectrum, uh, the the curve in the class. Uh, and that definitely didn't bode well for me. Professor came up to me and was like, you probably should major in bio. And I was like, yeah, you have a point. Um, so I kind of knew, learned to just drop my ego about this. And uh, and then at the time, all my classmates were doing computer science. And so I took an intro CS course. Um, I also didn't do too well. I think I got a C or a C minus as well, by the way, in the class, um, which is funny because now all I do is I you know, run a technically a tech slash fintech firm today. So I guess you never know what happens. <laughs> um, I didn't do too well in that either. And then um, my friends were like, well, you know, MIT has this really easy major called management science. Uh, you should look into it. It's very easy and I was like you know I I will because I really need to graduate and I'm worried with about my GPA so that that was what happened I ended up in finance uh you know it was I was never one of those kids that was like oh I've always wanted to be a trader and uh, you know be on Wall Street since I didn't even know what Wall Street was I grew up in Utah um you know I did not have that kind of background so um yeah that that's kind of how I ended up um originally in finance and then did all these internships thankfully um and then after that, um, realized, hey, I just need a job. I'm about to graduate from college. I've applied to a bunch of companies. Nobody wants me. Um, I'm in debt. <laughs> I need something to pay off my loans. Um, and one of my friends in school was like, so for my internship, one of my internships, um, we had to create a trading strategy. Okay. Um, and I created, uh, someone was like, hey, since you have a quant background, you know, I'll create a quant strategy, right? So I was like, okay, I'll create more of a quantitative trading strategy. Uh, the team didn't like it, then they didn't give me the offer. Um, but then one of my friends in, in MIT was like, hey, you can, you know, just trade it on your own, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can do that, really? <laughs> um, and so I just started trading on my own. And it's funny because, like, I didn't even know really what a hedge fund was. And then the first thing I did when I wanted to decide that I, you know, wanted to start a hedge fund was I Googled how to start a hedge fund. Like, <laughs> you know, and I think that's what every founder kind of does, right? You're like, how to start a startup, how to yeah. start a hedge fund. Well, now, now you talk to ChatGPT. Now you can have like a, a conversation with the internet. Yeah, now you guys have oh, more really tools did. than we did. Yeah. Um, and one of the few tools, by the way, I should mention, uh, one of the few tools I found on the internet that was out there, one of the few resources was Quantopian. Uh, I did come across, um, the, you know, Boston, the, back then the meetup.com, I think was still fairly new at the yeah. time. Yeah, there's the Boston Quant. Uh, was it called Algorithmic Trading or Quant Trading Meetup? Uh, yeah. Which was by you, by the way. I remember I uh, I actually searched through my email just barely to see like, okay, who was the one who you know? And it was actually the intro was from you. It was like, welcome to the the Meetup, and yeah. you know, this was ten plus years ago. Like, I, I still can't believe like <laughs> that that was kind of the the start of things, and it helped me in, in many ways. We'll, we'll talk about that too. But yeah, that was the, the rich That's origin. Amazing. Actually, I never knew that uh, <laughs> that we. Helped corrupt you into finance by... Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, like, that's not the answer I would say to investors, right? Because it, it, that just sounds horrible to, to an investor. So I'd say, hey, you know, we wanted to, I remember what I used to say, um, you know, we wanted to uh, bring more like math into finance. We wanted to, you know, utilize our skill set better um, in this mm -hmm. industry and hopefully lower the barrier to entry. Like, yeah, there's other ways to kind of frame the story, I guess. Uh, but, the, you know, the truth of the matter is kind of like, hey, <laughs> you know, um, we were young, we had nowhere else to go the markets were you know the job market wasn't doing too hot i think back in the day at and least what, for me what year was that um, this was 2012 um yeah, was yeah you know we were still around the financial crisis we're still kind of um uh, dealing with the aftermath of that a little yeah. bit um and uh you know for Quant me personally, also, I think also not, just because my gpa was bad yeah, yeah. Quant was like way out of favor uh, <laughs> i think in 12 i remember correctly um yeah you know i think um you have a very disarming way of telling the story, which is is extremely uh, humble. But the the thing that I hear when you're talking about this is that you wanted some control over your own destiny, mm -hmm. and I think I think your like extreme candor with the way things went is part of your kind of superpower for having control. Like if you're okay with the way that things go, then you can do whatever you want, right? You can yeah. You know, any kind <laughs> oh, of, for sure. Any kind of. Um, it's tough because how do I describe it? 
um, I guess the, the reason why I started it, you know, the hedge fund in general was it wasn't like, hey, I want to make a, a, a billion dollars or I want to make a, even a million dollars, you know. Um, my issue was I need a job. <laughs> um, and my motivation was that this actually woke me up in the morning. And I think that's actually a great sign to people, that's right? Like if is, I... Yeah. If I had looked at the numbers, I'm glad I did it at the time, uh, but I, if I had looked at the statistics of like startup failure rates, hedge fund failure rates, you know, how many hedge funds succeed from young people who started from college, actually surprisingly, you know, it was like Ken Griffin, there's like Bill Ackman, you know, there's actually quite a few yeah. people who have done, uh, uh, Ray Dalio, I don't know, there were Dalio was uh, close, he was, I think, I think it was right after business school for him, but yeah it was kind of the same thing he was writing a newsletter from his house you know was... yeah exactly and so but if i looked at the stats though it's still like very dismal it's slim to none yeah. um and a lot of them came from a, a different generation right they're kind of you'd call it maybe the second generation for them where citadel started there like 30 years ago i think by now so um whereas for us it's like we're starting at a time when quant trading is becoming more you know mainstream and more not really mainstream but it's more like you're starting to hear about it more there's more of a community uh yeah. sense going on here um and we're very much scrappy founders that started these you know right from scratch um without like a heavy you know like without tons and tons of experience or you know stuff like that coming in like we weren't making huge bets on day one or anything like that yeah. so there's like I think that felt for me was really fascinating. If I looked at the statistics uh, about like, hey, ninety five percent of these hedge funds will fail, you know, um, I I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> um, but you know, for me, it was like mainly motivation. I ignored you know just ignore those stats. Like just wake up in the morning and like this was what I really wanted to focus my time on um, during the day. And so I think just having that energy and that motivation, um, yeah. you know, and that's what I tell founders. By the way, a lot of times founders ask me, they're like, hey, I have this idea. And, you know, it kind of is ridiculous, but I, I, I kind of want to do it. You know, I'm like, well, does it wake you up in the morning? <laughs> you know, does it um, help you? You know, does it make you feel like you're alive? And does it make you have that energy to do stuff? And if so, like, then, you know, it doesn't matter whether, you know, you don't care what other people say, you know, yes, like maybe pe everyone will be like, this is a dumb idea. <laughs> um, yeah. But if you learn something from it, um, you know, I've never met a founder who's like, hey, I totally regret doing my startup, right? I think that's very rare, actually. Yeah. Um, you can use it as a learning opportunity at the end of the day and maybe give yourself a timeline of course you don't want to ever be you know starving and dying and you know have a roof over your head you gotta be able to pay your rent and everything yes of course so give yourself a timeline but like so long as it makes you wake up in the morning gives you energy i think that that's a great sign yeah yeah, yeah absolutely what uh, so i have i have a kind of random question so when i was in college i also had this thought like oh i wanted and um i wish we had actually figured out how to do this my my roommate uh, and I were talking about trading stocks and um, he had an idea that was essentially mean reversion. Uh, but this is like in the early 90s. So it probably would work quite well if we had figured out how to trade it. But we just like couldn't really figure out like how to get a brokerage account and how to, you know, connect the software to trade and um, kind of got excited about it for like a month and then nothing came of it. So I was just like very specifically, oddly specifically <laughs> curious how did you trade your strategy when you were still in school? Like what kind of account did you set up? Where did you trade it? How, how did it all Yeah, work? it was a bare bones. This was not high frequency trading. <laughs> yeah. So for people who- like a little FPJ I... uh, controller in your room that you were- <laughs> Nah, it's, uh, yeah, this is very much, um, we started off as primitive and kind of old school as you would, you know, pro probably get for back in the day, whatever technology we get our hands on. So same thing, by the way, we actually started with um, when we, my first like strategy that I, created uh for that internship was a mean re i believe it was a yeah it was a mean reversion strategy as well yeah. <laughs> um and did it work like yeah no you know <laughs> um it probably we did you know if you make tweaks to it maybe um if you change some parameters around and you know change some of the logic whatever else uh, maybe it would work um but uh you know it's just one of those things where when we first started yeah uh, we had a in terms of our setup so um, you know, we would get, I think we had accounts on like, um, you know, back then it was like interactive brokers. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was just whatever we could get our hands on back in the day. These are very much like retail trading, you know, platforms back in the day, at least, you know, I don't know yeah. now, of course they can accommodate a lot more kind of smaller funds and institutions and things like that. But, um, but, you know, 10 plus years ago, I think it was like, this was very much like very bare bones of like what we could get and afford. Um, and then I forgot what we would do for, um, you know, there were some things that we started, we kind of just did wrong on the tech side and some things we did right. Oh, the other thing, by the way, was um, 
uh, very early on, um, I think around even summer of 2013, we decided that um, we wanted to, you know, do this as like a hedge fund. And we also wanted to do it as, you know, do high frequency trading. We wanted to get our strategies yeah. more sophisticated. And, and so we knew from that, that um, there's two paths you could technically take. One is like you do the lean startup path of like, you know, let's create a bare bones MVP overnight and just launch ASAP. Um, yeah. And the tech will suck. Yes, it'll be, you know, maybe not even functioning, barely functioning. <laughs> um, but at least you'll have something to kind of bring it to the market and test it out, right, and trade it. Um, we actually did the opposite, for better or worse. Um, when I look back, I'm like, is that better? I don't really know. Um, it took us three years to launch instead. We took our time to build the tech to build. Uh, we raised funding in that time, by the way, too, because we were yeah. like, hey, we need if we wanted to do the data, for example, correctly, which is um, back then it was like, let's get the data directly from the exchange and clean it up ourselves. Right. And and just do everything, process everything ourselves and build build our own order management system. But data fee handlers back then, there's no other kind of major solutions out there. Um, and so that would take time. And so we decided, let's just build it. Um, today, I think I would approach it differently. If we started a fund today, it would be like, okay, buy versus build. You know, why reinvent the wheel? There's literally yeah. dozens of, you know, platforms for everything now. Data feeds, um, you know, handlers, there's backtesting platforms, there's uh, OMSs out there. <laughs> um, you know, there's all kinds of different solutions for the financial services industry now. So um, it's more about, you know, do you have the time to afford to build it versus just, you know, sp suck it up spend the money get yourself to launch <laughs> sooner rather than later right um and just go from there so yeah those are that's an interesting uh, question but yeah we started off at first very like basic retail stuff we were doing just like basic quant rule-based strategies and then we decided hey we want to bring this um pro hopefully to the next level you know lower our latencies a little bit more and um, establish more of a, you know, try to become more of an institutional product. And so um, that was why there's like, oh, there's a three year gap <laughs> uh, between the early trading and then when we actually launched the fund. So yeah. Did you keep trading like in the original way during those three years? Or did you sort of like stop trading and go heads down building your your new platform? Yeah, we, um, we pretty much stopped trading. Yeah, we were, I remember we stopped trading, uh, we became very much heads down on building out uh, this tech, which is, by the way, that period I remember was some of the most stressful of my life. Was it? <laughs> because, and you know, and it's one of those things as a founder, right? A first time founder, especially, is you kind of grossly underestimate how much time things take because you've yeah, never, yeah. for me, I've never done any of this before or anything that like for a that matter. <laughs> or a bug for a founder? I feel like, I feel like uh, consistently underestimating how long and how hard things will be, you know, obviously it can be disappointing, yeah. but it helps you get started. You know, it's it's like a a little trick for getting started on a big journey. Yeah, for sure, right? And you know, we'd be like, "Oh, are we going to launch next month or next month?" <laughs> you know, and then finally, when the time came, I remember we couldn't even believe it. Like, "Oh my gosh, we've launched!" You know, we we made it. It, it was just so unbelievable that we could finally start trading again. And because that's also like, you know, what are you if you're not a trader, right? What are you yeah. if you're not in the markets and participating and stuff, right? Can you even say you're a hedge fund? It's been almost three years. Like, you know, so there's a lot of that, and three years is a lifetime in the startup world. <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure. Um, it was definitely a stressful period. Yeah. <laughs> and how was it? Uh, Cause you said you raised money. So like where, where in that three year period did the money come in? Was it the very beginning of that or? Um, the first amount, let's see, it was kind of a seed round of funding. Um, and this was for, actually, let me think about this. How did we do this first? Um, oh, okay. So I should mention, uh, taking a step back, we actually raised both GP and LP funding, uh, which are slightly different forms. And you, you've done this too. So we're one of the few people. Yeah, but why, why don't you explain? Because I think this is something that's really interesting for people. Like financing a, a hedge fund is different than financing a tech startup. Uh, you've done both now, right? So you can, you can you know, explain. And I, yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be <laughs> interesting to linger on that for a bit. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so hedge funds, like they raise, uh, you know, and PE firms, whatever else, venture capitalists, right, they raise LP funding. Uh, so you'll hear like your VCs will mention like, hey, we raise, you know, we're, our LPs are doing this, or we need to talk to more LPs. Like, uh, that was the case for us as well. So LP funding is just basically the and LP series limited partners um, within our fund. So these are basically your hedge fund investors, right? So they're putting money into your fund, you don't we're not even allowed to touch that fund, by the way, like our administrator touches that money, um, we can trade that money in the markets, and then it goes back into this, you know, um, account, and, and that's it, it's just like there. <laughs> um, and so that money we can't use towards like, um, most things, you know, unless it's like very directly related to the fund, like it could be our fund lawyer related setup costs, things like that, maybe. Um, but we can't use that to like pay for our meals or furniture or salary, not even salaries, we never used it, you know, we we're 
we're fairly strict about um, you know, what we're allowed to use that kind of funding for. The primary purpose is to trade that in the markets, um, give them some kind of hopefully some returns, uh, and then take a little cut of that, right? Like, a, um, would it be, you know, 20% off of, maybe it was like two and 20, let's say that was the case, um, maybe 20% off of the, the gains or, you know, 2% management fee, something like that. Uh, we, we were zero and 40, which we can talk about later too. <laughs> um, but anyway, we would take a, you know, whatever fees we could. And that's the a hedge fund sort of by definition, right? It's like you, um, you're managing other people's money, you kind of trade it in the markets, you you know, take hopefully make some gains and then you take a sliver of that gain and like that's kind of how we survive as fund. <laughs> um, and so, but yeah, early on, so we had to raise money from them because like that's our customer base essentially. And then we also simultaneously raised venture capital funding, which is uh, GP funding in, in a sense. So um, these are going to be people who invest in our uh, management company, which is the kind of managing the fund itself. So they're two different, they're different entities, by the way. Um, and uh, they're, so these are VCs where they're placing a bet on, and by the way, like in terms of a hedge fund, does a hedge fund fit into a VC model? Usually it doesn't. Um, there's a few cases of, we're one of the few cases, the two of us, <laughs> of hedge yeah. funds that have raised venture capital in the past. Um, Numeri, I think, is another example out there. Um, there's a few more. I can't remember. I can't place my. I don't even know if Numeri has launched their fund, uh, but th there's a few examples that I, that I haven't. Just been a while since I've talked to all these folks. Um, yeah. But we were the generation that had, you know, started doing that. By the way, and so anyway, we raised both simultaneously. The fundraising process is different between the GP and the LP fundraising. Um, I don't know about you, Foss. I feel like the LP fundraising was more of a check the box process. Like um, at least for me, it was very much like where's your fact sheet, your returns, <laughs> you know, like they yeah. kind of just look at these things. And then, yes, they do operational due diligence and stuff like that, too. Um, whereas I feel like the GP fundraising was more like, tell me your story. <laughs> you know, what tech are you building, right? Because um, yeah. and the reason why we were, um, we ended up, being able to score the venture fund, like to get that funding to begin with on the GP front um, was because we were building a technology that was different. Um, and if we hadn't done that, then, you know, we wouldn't fit into the VC model at all, right? Because the ultimate goal of a venture capitalist is like, we should be able to have an exit, either we IPO um, or we yeah. sell our business to someone else. And in order to do that, we need IP. We need to have some kind of technology that's valuable that we're kind of building and scaling over time. And so, um, yeah, I'm curious from your perspective as well on this though. Yeah, I think um, definitely on the, uh, so we, we had a corporate entity that uh, then uh, owned the general partnership and the uh, corporate entities where we did the VC fundraising. So that looked a lot like a typical uh, tech company. Um, and yeah, I think in, especially early, like the earlier stage, the more it's story driven and more it's sort of uh, team driven and kind of opportunity. And then, it's, you know, you get later and later uh, in, in stages, it gets more and more about like the hard results, I would say, on the equity side. Uh, whereas on the fund, um, I think the fund, uh, I don't know, I think there was like, for us, there was an element of story for the fund because we were doing this unusual uh, crowdsourcing structure. Um, and that definitely um, inspired a lot of enthusiasm for, um, especially like seed stage limited partners, you know, people that like to seed new funds. Um, I found the diligence on the LP side, uh, you know, it varies from firm to firm, but in both cases, there were firms that did like extremely deep diligence on our, on our company, both on the venture side and on the limited partner side. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of rigor about the investment process, the, the team, the legal structure um, that was, highly highly detailed very in-depth and um i i i found the um you know the lp diligence there's just like so much savvy around um, you know strategies and understanding them and uh understanding like the process behind it and what the portfolio looks like and so uh yeah i, I think they were very different but i, I to be candid i found both of them like quite difficult um you know like big big effort, big operation to, to get through. Um, yeah. And doing both at the same time uh, was, I don't know about you, I found that quite, quite difficult also just to, because it's, you're switching mindsets so frequently, right? To explain your company in different perspectives to different people. So, you know, after, um, after financing it as a venture, I guess in retrospect, that was another question I had was, um, 
you know, there's there's different types of investors that will buy into a GP, right? So so uh, LPs will often do both, right? There are LPs that will put money in the fund and then also buy in and provide operating capital. Uh, and then there are venture investors that, um, you know, will buy in, uh, buy equity and provide operating capital. And, um, you know, in retrospect, do you think, do you think hedge funds should be venture backed? Like, does it make sense to have a venture backed hedge fund? It's tough. I would say no, actually. Um, and unless they're, you know, because it doesn't fit into the VC model, unless like they're building some sort of technology that can, um, you know, one day have some sort of exit opportunity, you know, let's say seven to 10 years down the road, like the typical VC path there. Um, yeah. And by the way, there's a lot of hedge fund recently, there's been a lot more kind of these smaller hedge fund seeders. I'm not sure what they're called. Like they kind of help uh, specifically hedge funds, like day one hedge funds launch. And some of them are more on the traditional LP side. Like we, and we met some of them by the way, because they um, also maybe have invested in um, Dome Yard back in the day. Um, yep. There was quite a few actually day one um, LP kinds of organizations where they also might place and make a, a GP, you know, investment as well into the management company where they want to stake in the company itself yeah. um, and they want to stake in the fund. Um, and so, so that there are situations like that. It is fairly rare still today. It's not like a common, you know, like you're not going to have a meetup <laughs> of these types of people anytime. Yeah. Soon, so it's not um you know that big yeah, very but, small yeah. world mm -hmm. and um i'm curious about the trajectory for your strategies so you you know uh th this is a big theme for quantopia i had one idea in the beginning and then by the end uh quite a different idea about how to do crowdsourced alpha um so i'm just curious for for dome dome yard you know what was kind of like your initial hypothesis and and kind of what was the trajectory you know, for the different types of strategies they had by the end. Yeah. Um, so surprisingly, actually, um, so our hypothesis has always stayed the same, which is interesting. It's always been like, hey, we want to do high frequency trading. Um, you know, we want to be able to be on the cutting edge of technologies in the financial space and to have kind of the strategies that are, you know, latency sensitive. Um, we would want to trade at intervals that are, you know, basically trade like thousands of times a day, <laughs> ideally. And and by the end of it, we ended up achieving that. We were trading like, what, I think 25,000 times. It was really crazy because you see the daily broker statements and, and they'd just be like so long long that you know the file would break and it wouldn't even open because it's just page after page of you know all these trades that we were, we were placing um and so ultimately we achieved that but it's more like how we achieved it that um was totally different than what we had expected um and you know grossly underestimated a lot of what was involved in terms of being able to build that and create it um i'm glad we stuck to that vision though um because you know it ended up working for at least a you know a couple years it worked out very well for us <laughs> um and and it was definitely a good learning opportunity now because you know now it's like i know so much our team knows a lot about things like market microstructure <laughs> you know we just know so much about all the regulations and the microstructure the markets um everything about data as well and uh, which has positioned me well by the way for the current company we're building uh, so it's interesting because even though i you know was i the best person in the world to start a hedge fund absolutely not <laughs> um and i just you know kind of was running based off of energy and motivation right and kind of that almost like youth in a sense um and now that i no longer have that youth <laughs> you know i'm like oh, I feel a little, i'm a lot more jaded now um but now that i kind of hear it's like okay at least I'm running off of experience and in terms of who to start a data company. Um, now I'm like, oh, I know for a fact that we are a fantastic team to start this company um, because we know everything about, you know, how a data company should run, how a product should be, you know, what what we should look for in the data, how we should clean it up, um, what that infrastructure should look like. It, it's to the point where like um, our customers will come to us and be like, hey, could we get business advice from you? You know, they'll ask for advice on all kinds of other fronts too because they're like, these guys like know what they're doing. And so, so that, that helps a lot. But um, but yeah, I would say definitely back then it was like, you know, you still have to start from zero, which is interesting. We started from scratch from zero, right? From the hedge fund days of yeah. no network, no connections, no money, <laughs> you know, like none, we didn't have any of that, no reputation either. Um, and you just have to earn your way uh, around and, you know, have the motivation, energy to kind of get um, get up and running, and get started. So, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I'd love to go back to the point you made about uh, how much you learned um, and in a kind of esoteric field, right? Like market microstructure uh, is very specific actually to HFT, right? That's that's like the one of the core parts of the business. Um, and, you know, did you expect when you got started that the sort of really valuable thing that you would take away from this massive, massive endeavor was that you, you really understood market structure and data? Like, was that on your mind when you were starting? 
oh, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> um, no, not at all. Um, and so, yeah, that was interesting too, because I remember back then it was like, um, let's just try to get to launch. You know, it was almost like we were thinking about it. We couldn't even think of the bigger picture because it was a day at a time, just trying yeah. to be in survival mode and, you know, um, and back then I remember it was just in case you're curious about our lifestyle, like um, we, our first office was an apartment building uh, because we couldn't afford an office, obviously. So had an apartment building and then across the street, there was a, a Shaw's, which is like a, it's like a grocery store, essentially. Um, now it's Star Market, I think. Uh, we would go there and I would literally just buy like ramen. And back then kale was very cheap. So I remember uh, we had like this horrible diet of like ramen and like kale for some reason. Um, and that was like, it was very much scrappy startup lifestyle. But you know, and I had two co-founders, by the way, that was one thing that helped. And oh, one thing I should say, by the way, when, when it comes to co-founders, I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel like the best early validation you can get for uh, an idea uh, is it's not to ask your friend, you know, hey, Foss, would you like to do this? Uh, yeah, you know, right? Like your friends yeah. aren't going to tell you no. Yeah. Um, I think the best validation is actually when another human being likes your idea so much that they drop everything and, you know, they quit their job and they want to like come and work with you on this idea, yeah. aka a co-founder. <laughs> um, and so it was definitely validating for me to have, I'm, I'm the type of person, by the way, that seeks social validation. <laughs> um, I need to have confirmation that like, you know, society agrees with me, even though I know it's horrible. <laughs> um, I don't do it as much now, but definitely back then it was like nice to have, you know, two other people who were able to drop everything. We had, they had different backgrounds as well, um, which was great. And wanted to do stuff with me so the three of us would be very much scrappy and you know like we would live in that apartment and and then work in that apartment <laughs> it was a very odd uh scenario would i ever redo that again no <laughs> um but that was kind of um what we did early on yeah <laughs> and how did you meet your two co-founders uh, we met through, I think one of them was like through a trading competition in school. Yeah, this is like, again, <laughs> you know, in school it was, um, we, and then the other one actually lived in the same dorm room. Um, and so we knew, I knew him for a while too. Um, but it was one of those things where the three of us had very little in common actually. And, and one of them didn't even go to MIT. So, um, but the thing is we had the same career goals in a sense, uh, so a very similar career goal. We want, we were like, Hey, we want to be able to you know, let's trade on our own and kind of see what happens um, and go from there. And we were all interested in, you know, quantitative trading at the time. And so I think that kind of career goal motivated us. And we had different majors and different backgrounds. Uh, we weren't, you know, like we weren't like best friends <laughs> or anything like that, I wish, uh, you know, but um, that was kind of the reason why we met just and, and decided to work under this shared goal, I guess, of um, wanting to kind of make it in the, the financial industry. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, it, you know, I think I, I find it amazing that um, people connect. And you're saying like just in the context of this new company, yeah, and they totally go for it. You know, like <laughs> like living in the hacker house apartment, yeah. You know, literally <laughs> eating and sleeping your project uh, is is pretty amazing. That's like a very pure experience. Um, <laughs> Oh my, you know, what was funny uh, really quickly is uh, when that show Silicon Valley came out, like the HBO yes. show, yeah. and I watched the first season, I was a little traumatized from it because it reminded it? me of kind of like what it was truly, you know, yes, they made it really funny and stuff, but for yeah. me, it just brings back all these memories and some of them I didn't want to remember, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that was interesting to, to watch that and be like, that was me, you know? Yeah, yeah I think that's like a great endorsement of that show because it is a parody but it hits very close to home. I like I stopped watching it because uh, it was the same thing. I was like in the midst of Quantopia when that uh, show came out, and um, yeah, I couldn't make it through an episode. I would have <laughs> it was just too close. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, I think I love what you said about the validation that comes from people kind of joining your cause, and like obviously like your co-founders are both the first and also kind of like the biggest risk takers, right, to come in and, and uh, work on something with you. Do you, like, remember the conversations with your co-founders, like, when they said yes? Like, what what what's the setup? You know, paint a vignette for us with your Oh, I remember, especially for one of them, um, Jonathan, our, one of our technical co-founders, um, I remember we were, the three of us were, like, in a, a taxi or an Uber. I, I don't remember because this was Uber was still new. <laughs> Um, we were riding in some ca some kind of vehicle, and uh, 
just sitting in the back and I remember just like uh the two of us the, the two of us me and Luca had already decided hey we want to work together and then we kind of uh we were like hey Jonathan like uh you know uh, congrats on your offer you know he had accepted an offer somewhere I don't remember where it was like Apple or VMware or wherever <laughs> and we were like hey uh, would you be interested in like uh you know uh rescinding that offer <laughs> and uh, coming to you know work with us on a startup idea and it was his first I remember his first reaction was like ah nah you know like that's that's kind of strange right I already have an offer right and you know he's already doing very fairly well and Jonathan was a really great student he's the opposite of me like great student you know like he was in the honor society and everything at MIT I don't remember what the name of it was called but he, he was doing very very well um mm -hmm. and he's studying computer science or he was like the kid that I wish I was like you know just ideal major everything like he knew back then that doing CS would be the right approach and it was um and uh so yeah he kind of his first things he was like now nah, look he had so many different job offers and opportunities um and then I think it was about a week later he kind of messaged me on um it was Gchat back in the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, hey, uh, you know, about that startup idea, do you want to like, you know, do you want to work on this? Do you want to talk about it? And so we talked about it. And then um, I think he ended up like, I think he had rescinded his offer. I don't know what it was. But and by the way, in case you're curious, after our startup failed, um, Jonathan is now working on his second company as well um, in the biotech space. And they're doing oh, cool. very well. Um, I visited their office. They are in Cambridge. And it was funny because... Um, they're actually in the office building that we wish that dome yard could have been in. <laughs> so it was like he had accomplished one of his, his dreams. Of two his, two um, dreams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We wish that our building, by the way, for originally for dome yard, we couldn't afford it, but um, there's a place called like university park in Cambridge, which is um, just near MIT. You're like really close to MIT essentially. Yeah. Um, and it's like now we're a bunch of biotech firms like Novartis or I forgot, there's a bunch of them. They're all kind of AstraZeneca, you know, they're all kind of there. Um, yeah. and so he's there. He has, I think he has like an entire floor. Um, oh, they're, wow. So they're doing like really good. <laughs> so I was, I was so happy to see that. I was like, this is like... Yeah. So nostalgic in a sense, um, but yeah. So so now they're they're that building. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, it is great to see uh, your teammates like <laughs> years later. All the things that people have accomplished. That's amazing. Um, and uh, just like you said, it gives you that like good nostalgic feeling for the uh, for the early days. Yeah. Um, so I think we were, we started talking about uh, like evolution, and one thing that I think is super interesting is that like your or hypothesis stayed the same throughout. Um, did the did like the underlying strategies change a lot um, within that? Yes, all the time. Uh, and this was something. Maybe it was a part of it was because we were doing high frequency trading that um, it just naturally. By the way, in terms of strategies, I feel like HFT strategies decay a lot quicker. Obviously, they're yeah. like a long term strategy, um, and so our average strategy, like even a half life, would sometimes be just like months. Uh, yeah. Or even, you know, after like three months, we'd be like, oh, we need to do something about this. <laughs> um, and so our team was constantly revising, even just if it's adjusting parameters in our strategy, it doesn't need to be like, you know, scrapping something overall and then starting from scratch, but rather we would adjust more parameters with certain strategies. Um, we had different types of strategies we would run as well. I think we had different kind of teams and people responsible for different ones. So, you know, if we, whether we did like market taking, market making, uh, like liquidity taking, yeah, all those different things. We had those types of strategies. Um, we had, you know, the the usual stuff too. I'm trying to think of what else we did. Um, we did stat arb as well. Um, lots of yeah, stat arb market making, and I think it was like basket trading, something like that too. So we had like different types of strategies we would run uh, on various types of you know with various folks on the team. Um, and then, but all those different types of strategies overall, we would have to constantly be kind of monitoring and um, figuring out how do we improve upon these and make them better and go from there. Uh, the good news, by the way, about HFT, I felt like was that um, the the uh, like feedback cycle was very fast yeah. in in this, you know, in quant in general, um, but especially in HFT, where at the end of the day, I can go home, you know, if we made a thousand trades or more during the day, uh, it was nice in that it's kind of like law of large numbers, right? You can go home knowing like exactly how well or how bad you did because you couldn't have gotten lucky you know, sometimes you get lucky a thousand times, I don't know, <laughs> but it's hard to get lucky like that many times in a row. And so it's like, yeah. oh, this is very much skill based. I know how well I did or how bad I did um, and what to improve upon. And so that was nice in that we would get like uh, lots of feedback fairly quickly. And so um, we were able to, you know, go in there and try to adjust and revise things and try it out for another day and, you know, see what would happen then. So, um, but yeah, like overall, that was kind of, those are the things we did. There was a lot of exploration involved, to be honest. There was a lot of things that we would explore that just did not work out whatsoever. Yeah. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I remember we had some of our early like colleagues as well, you know, we would, um, I remember they would say, Hey, why don't we explore even things like technical, we did everything, we did technical indicators, you know, stuff like that. And then quickly discovered that didn't work. <laughs> um, and then we were like, hey, let's look at this instead. Let's look at this. And, um, we would oftentimes like read, uh, academic papers as well on topics and see like, Hey, can we try to implement something with this idea involved? Um, and so there's a lot of that creativity and exploration. And um, that was one thing, by the way, in terms of hiring, uh, that was hard to hire for was like, how do we hire for someone who's, uh, who can be, especially on the quant research side, like um, creative, uh, but not like too academic. It was hard to describe. It's like, if they're too academic, um, then they're kind of like running a research lab and they're used to like this five year PhD kind of, you know, endless research, yeah. but then we're like, this needs to be applied somewhere. Like we need to eventually start trading it and we need to give them a time line um and so it's interesting because then we learned that um and i think a lot of quant firms do this as well as they have like a training period now you know where it's for six 12 months like you just train them on how to apply all that research that they've learned in a you know more of a university setting um and to you know bring it out into the real world how do they you know do that and to get used to that mindset as well <laughs> um and so yeah it was on something that was tough for us was like trying to figure out how to hire even the, the right people for for the job and to go from there yeah what about um, you know people doing the research and then the people building the technology? That interface, I think, is like a really tricky interface for uh, yeah. Quant and HFT. How, how did that go for for Domyarn? Yeah, that was an interesting question, actually. And actually, I think that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that. So yeah, that's a really, really great one. Um, so let me think. For uh, our structure, yes, we had a lot of quant researchers. We had a research team. Then we had a technology team. Uh, tech team was mainly focused on, you know, there's a bunch of software engineers. Um, and they would be focused on things like, um, you know, building up our order management system or creating our data feed handlers. Um, and there was, and we, so we had definitely had earlier on, we would have like a very big, um, team on the the tech side of things on the software side and then um, over time I think that started changing whereas after we launched then it was like hiring more quant researchers and mm. getting more of the research stuff in place so for us it was more chronological because we had a small budget we couldn't just afford to hire a whole team of researchers you know and especially because back, back then um, early on it's kind of like founder driven same with any startup right like um, when you're early stage it's like founder led sales and for us it was like founder led strategies for a while um, until maybe you know past the time we got to launch we were able to see things be okay and then let's try to hire more people um, for these roles and go from there. So at the very beginning, I would say I was very much just driven by the three founders on the team and then um, figuring out how do we, who do we hire on the tech side and, you know, build up this infrastructure first and then um, figure out on the strategy side how things work. But it's interesting, by the way, there's an interesting relationship, <laughs> um, which you kind of alluded to where um, I think, and this is one of the I think core fundamental, I wouldn't say disadvantages, but it's a common frustration I hear among software engineers on the team, which is that in finance, uh, inherently there's a front office and a back office. Um, and, and like, uh, you know, the wording kind of implies something, which is that everybody wants to be in the front office um, because it, I mean, front office is definitely a lot more exciting. And a lot of times the back office does have to, um, you know, that's the other thing. We interview a lot of, um, oh, by the way, like a lot of software engineers who join Datavento even, um, one of the, their frustrations when they came from finance and they came from like a company like, uh, I don't know, like Citadel or Virtu, you know, those kinds of firms, is that when they were a software engineer at those firms, that they would work for the front office, essentially. Like, um, they yeah. would work for traders who told them, hey, can you, like, build this thing for me in my dashboard or something? And then, you know, then the software engineer would be like, okay, you know, and they'll try to figure out the parameters and try to work with the trading team on that. So um, it's almost like they work for the front office. And so we do see a lot of situations where, trade sorry people who are like software engineers they want to become quant researchers <laughs> um and you'll see that in, even in the forums i'm sure in quantopian forums people are like hey i'm a software engineer how do i go into the quant finance how do i become this because yes you know front office is naturally a lot more sexy you're um you're going to be facing the markets and you're going to be trading and getting more feedback on your project so i guess it just sounds a lot more exciting <laughs> um if, but of course like, like there's nothing wrong with back office right like i've had back office internships I, my job was back office you know at dome yard over time like I did all the back office functionality and stuff too. And so that was great. I totally loved it. Love it systems. Good. It's, it's phenomenal. Like yeah. I, it's I fun. <laughs> and being in the background, I actually like have learned about myself, like not being in spotlight is nice. I like being like, uh, you know, doing something that's contributing, but not necessarily like in the white hot spotlight all the time, which the front office, yeah. <laughs> it's the trade off, right? Exactly. And like the disadvantage of kind of seeking that glory of the front office is that, um, you know, you're then suddenly you're chasing PNL all the time. And once you put yourself in that those shoes, 
and it's stressful. And, you know, it's kind of like um, when you're in tech, I feel like you have second chances, you know, in finance, yeah. rarely do you get a second chance. If you, your hedge fund performs poorly, you know, that return, those returns are like tattooed on you for the rest of your life. <laughs> like, right. you know, every time someone asks for a tariff sheet, like those are always going to be there. And every time you can expect an investor to come in and be like, Hey, what happened on this year? And you have to almost like explain it to the point where we would literally put some disclaimers and explaining, you know, like what happened on those years so that they would stop asking those questions <laughs> over and over. Um, that probably didn't work so, though. They probably still asked, right? They probably still wanted to hear from you what happened. I know, year. right? Even now people are like, Hey, like what happened in 20, you know, like these years, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so, so that's like the the pros and cons of it, right? Is like, yes, um, if you do well, yes, there's this. It's like high risk, high reward, um, and you're, you know, you're hopefully set for life. Like, there's a lot of great things about it, but then, you know, then on the years you do poorly, then it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's a big ego hit, <laughs> and yeah. and it's humbling. It's uh, it's eye opening, and um, then people always will ask, like, hey, what happened? And uh, you can't, re you know, you don't really get a second chance sometimes after those types of events happen. Um, and it uh, can be fairly tough in those years as well. So it's almost like a roller coaster, I guess. It's like your emotions are more extreme. Like I remember on the good years, we were, you know, on cloud nine and doing so incredibly well. Um, you know, even things like, you know, I hate to say this, like I, I mentioned, I seek social validation. We would be invited to conferences, to submit papers for publications, to contribute to like, you know, stuff like World Economic Forum, you know, things like that, right? I think it was like, just nice to have those opportunities. And then in the bad years, it was like, all that disappeared. Then we were audited, <laughs> you know, then we went through like, there was one year um, in 2018, we were audited like five or six times in the course yeah. of a year um, because of uh, mistakes I made, by the way. And uh, by the way, we I know we didn't even talk about this, um, which is that early on at Dome Yard, um, we wrote a list of kind of like principles, you know, like principles by Ray Dalio, like the book, right? So yeah. uh, Ray, you know, Ray Dalio writes all these like principles that worked that was out well very, for him. very in vogue at the time that- uh, Yeah, that yeah. And, and so I was like, hey, like, I, I think my principles are better. And so we wrote a list of millennial principles. And um, over the years, and this was early on, it turns out over the years, almost all the principles turned out wrong in the end. And the reason why we were audited was because of one of those principles turning out wrong, which is that um, it was, you know, principle of like, back then we were like, we had no reputation. So we're like, let's hire service providers with like really big names. And again, this could be different. It just maybe was my experience that it just didn't work out. Um, let's hire very big service providers that have a big reputation um, to help us with, you know, these types of things. And so we hired one of the biggest um, fund administrators out there that, uh, you know, and everyone's, every fund's required to have an administrator. And so we hired a really, really big name to kind of help us with the fund. And uh, they were late on our financial statements, <laughs> um, despite being how much money we were paying them. And, you know, they were late and stuff too. Um, and so- Was, it because, was late, it because of the high frequency strategies? Like, did you scale bomb them with uh, all the- Not at all, actually. So HFT, the good news about that was um, because we closed at the end of every day, um, we had no open positions to evaluate. And mm. so technically it was easier for them mm. um, to, you know, evaluate. Our, all I needed to do is just put together our broker statements and to, you know, put the financials together. It was fairly simple, actually. But um, what happened was, you know, we messaged them and they were like, hey, I'm sorry, we have bigger clients to deal with. Um, oh, wow. and they, you know, that's that's the last thing you want to hear as a startup, right? Yeah. So oh, sorry, we have bigger customers to deal with. Like, you're the last priority. And that was when we realized, like, oh, crap, you know, maybe we shouldn't have gone with the biggest firm in the world <laughs> for this job. Um, and so they were late. And then uh, we missed the regulatory deadline um, for the SEC and the NFA and whatever other, you know, entities. And uh, so then immediately the audits start coming in. <laughs> and I just remember just, I had to cancel one of my vacations because um, they were coming in and they were like, we're gonna come into your office on these dates. And and I was like, you know what? Like I'll cancel my vacation. I'll just make it, get it over and done with because I'd rather just, you know, do this yeah. faster. Um, but it was bad. It was like a, just a, looking back, it was a terrible, not that the audit went bad. The audits went well, but it was a terrible <laughs> experience for me um, in terms of how much time you have to spend. You don't expect audits. To, it's not like a VC audit where it's like you send them your financials and that's it. It was right. like, they would go through everything. Um, yeah. The one of the things that we did get in, not really, we never got like fined or anything. We never got in trouble by the way. But one thing that we got, um, they would give you like more of a, not really a warning. It was more like, you know, you have to fix this and then we'll like check off the audit and like approve it. And so one of the things they told us to fix, for example, just give you a sense of how niche this is, our ethics training test, <laughs> um, we didn't write down on the test the format um, that the test would be in. 
um, like, is it going to be on paper or is it going to be like a power, yeah. like a, you know, like a clicking online test. And we got dinged for that, you know, and it's like, really, <laughs> like, um, you know, and so I guess the lesson learned there was also that um, we should have probably hired a compliance person earlier on because this was a full time compliance is a full time job. Um, yeah. Back then they would recommend, hey, your compliance officer should be like your fifth hire, even as early as your fifth. Um, and, and now I understand, you know, after we were audited, we're like, oh, I get it. You know, who, who knew back then I was kind of naive. I was like, how hard can compliance be? You just follow the rules, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> like you just well, report that's things. <laughs> that's the surprising thing about both accounting and compliance is, um, mm -hmm. that there are lots and lots of rules, obviously, but, um, you have to, especially when you're doing things that are very innovative, um, you need to be very good at interpreting those rules for the new context of whatever you're doing. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I think I think that is a very good lesson. You want to have a uh, both a compliance person early, and um, I think one of the traits of the compliance person is like experience plus just like very good lateral thinking because you're doing things you haven't you know that haven't been done before. They need to anticipate um, mm -hmm. in a way that isn't all that common um, in compliance for finance. But um, yeah, that's a very good lesson. I want to go back to the millennial principles, though, because um, I love this idea. So you there by like read the, read the Dahlia book and because this also I feel like this like swept through all of finance. That book was so popular um, and everyone everyone was uh, seemed to be like talking about it and talking about their principles. Um, are there any other gems that you remember from the, the millennial principles that you you uh might revise out right did any survive actually that's probably more interesting is if if there's yeah. any that that like you know worked and you stuck with yeah um so back in the day we had interviewed and i think we'd hired some folks uh, from bridgewater by the way itself mm -hmm. ray dahlia's firm and so we knew from those experiences talking to all these Bridgewater people that Bridgewater's culture, um, I mean, people describe it as big brother, you know, uh, that it wasn't the the kind of culture that, you know, you would want to kind of work in, like a work environment. It wasn't like a safe, kind of comfortable work environment for a lot of people who we interviewed, at least. I don't know. But that kind of gave me this bias that like, hey, Bridgewater has this terrible culture. You know, we can do a better job. <laughs> um, and so instead of having this kind of big brother, you know, kind of culture where people were encouraged to be brutally honest with each other and report each other, um, you know, if you notice any kind of sketchy behaviors, whatever it was, um, we were like, hey, let's, we wanted our office to look more like uh, Facebook or Google. <laughs> um, and this turned out wrong in the end. So so basically just a long story short was, um, our office, you know, I don't know if you, you've been to, like a lot of content folks have kind of visited our office. We would host events, whatever else too, back in the day. And um, our office literally was like open office uh, kind of setting. Uh, you walk in, a lot of our investors were very impressed, by the way. They would walk in and be like, wow, like this is, this is beautiful. Because yeah, absolutely. It was beautiful, you know, high rise open office kind of culture. Um, and there was, we had a game room in our office. You know, it was like very much like that kind of culture. Game room, there was free food, you know, the investor walk in and there's just free food and games yeah. and stuff um, and uh, just things like that. So it definitely had more of the Facebook, Google vibes, I would feel like in terms of that was what we wanted it to be. Um, but then it turned out actually um, a lot of those were wrong for us in the end. So uh, to give you a sense, like even with the free food, and I, I know this is a controversial one because a lot of, I know there's like recently during the pandemic or right, New York Times wrote articles about like um, how free food was bringing people back into the office and that it was yeah. a good thing. Um, for us, free food was actually a bad thing. <laughs> Overall, like I actually have, I still have nightmares about it like today, which is weird. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, like a lot of people, um, like kids would like have nightmares about like missing tests and exams and stuff in school my nightmares are about like free food for some reason <laughs> which is like so bizarre but anyway um what is a nightmare about free food like what is that <laughs> what happens in that nightmare the yeah so like not there or there's too much uh, it or it's just more like um so we would order free food uh, back then it was like i think mondays wednesdays and fridays every other day we would get free food um for the team like free lunches essentially and mm -hmm. um but the thing is like it actually decreased the morale of the team because everybody on the team had a very different diet and they had different uh, preference not even diet just preferences right yeah. so um anyway i learned because it was um, my it was technically my job as well as another person's job eventually to like start to order the free food but it's for me it was like early on it's my job obviously um and we would order the food and uh figure out what people wanted and stuff like that and the frustrating part there was just that um you know everybody had a different 
preference. And every time we ordered something, somebody would be very unhappy. Um, it would make sense. We had vegetarians, vegans on the yeah. team. We had Atkins diet, whole 30 diet, keto diet. Um, and then all the religions, right? Like Jewish, Mormon, uh, Muslim, like, it's so like, because of all the different, like everyone had a very drastic diet because it was Food such is so important to people. <laughs> it's so, so important. Uh, yeah. Right. The, I think, um, uh, the flip side of that is, um, I think paying attention to people, people's dietary needs you win a lot of friends if you yeah, can if that's you can, true <laughs> right? people people remember that for sure <laughs> unfortunately I, I was really bad at it and i made a lot of enemies <laughs> um and so and then was, sometimes it was surprising like people would be like christina i just i don't like cheese and i'd be like what do you mean and they're like are, are you lactose intolerant you know they're like no, no no i'm okay with cream and like ice cream but i just don't want cheese you know and i'm cheese. like Oh my gosh, like explain this to me, you know, so so it's definitely like, um, it was quite a lot of it, that kind of experience. And then my so the reason why we wanted free food, just to give you a sense, the logic was like, hey, it brings people together. Um, it actually saves time. So they don't have to go downstairs and walk around town and figure out what to eat for lunch that day. So kind of hopefully eliminate some sorts of sense of like indecision paralysis with people. Um, and then also hopefully it'll encourage people on different teams to work together a little bit like, hey, what did you do today right across this team? Yeah. What were you doing on the investment? side were we doing on the software side and so we were hoping that it would kind of um, have better camaraderie amongst each other as a team as well as just kind of save people time and have them work more hours essentially um and it didn't happen um we would always have people very upset about the food and people are passive aggressive about it <laughs> for better or worse over time you know because you become comfortable in the environment i think uh, yeah you're able to kind of feel for kind of how um people are feeling about the food and stuff so yeah it didn't work out for us in the end um and then it was funny because then we got rid of the free food and then everyone was so happy <laughs> they were way happier just choosing their own lunch and just going out on their own and we're like great and then that was like great then we don't have to waste any money on food anymore and and oh by the way the amount of waste we had all that extra yeah. food that was devastating to us because like what do we do and there, there wasn't a program you know where i was like i wish we could just go outside and feed it to the homeless like that it's not as easier said than done <laughs> um and so we would just have all this waste and um so yeah anyway that it just made me feel bad uh, at the mm -hmm. end of the day getting rid of it made me feel good and so or it made our team you know better to the morale improved and um, yeah. people could just bring their own meals and get their own food so yeah <laughs> you know, i think is really interesting about that is um i like uh, recently i've just been thinking about the different types of stress that different jobs bring or different companies bring um and you know what it feels like and and uh you know some positions i've had in my life are like really high deadline stress like all you're thinking about is like delivering to a plan and you know hitting dates and things like that um and others you know it's more like the front office stress they're talking about where it's like you just need to deliver some result whether it's like a sales result or you know performance in a fund or something and um in a bigger company actually i realized is there's a lot of um this is so naive because i've never really worked uh i've only recently worked in a big company yeah um kind of late in my career but it, it, a lot of it's like interpersonal like the the dominant stress is like you know negotiating with other people for yeah. kind of everything like for resources so this lunch thing it seems like very um like might sound superficial but actually it's like that is the thing that is the thing that makes companies like one of the things that makes companies really hard to craft is that you're creating like all of these relationships between yourself and others. And as the CEO, right, you're trying to, if you think what you're trying to do for lunch, you're trying to bring everybody together because mm -hmm. you had this like vision for how people would relate. And um, it's super difficult. And when you feel kind of responsible for other people's relationships with each other, right. I think that's like a, very high art form like people that are good at that good at fostering relationships between other people it's kind of amazing yeah amazing to see. it's not easy uh, i think it's fascinating you found that like go get your own lunch was was better <laughs> uh, it's interesting you brought up a good point which is that from a almost like from a hiring perspective or a job seeking perspective um you know you go on a lot of company websites and they'll have like a list of their perks that they offer yeah. and, and i bet you anything free food <laughs> if they offer it that'll be on their their site yeah. as like a perk um and, and that was a lesson we had learned which is that um a lot of times companies try to you know like for us too right we were trying to get more employees through having all these perks um and uh, you know same with if you're applying to jobs and stuff like my advice there is don't fall for those perks <laughs> um yeah. you're you know right employees don't stay because of free food they don't stay because of and that was that was a kpi we use actually i remember for 
Club, like the free food was like, hey, were people happy? Was the morale good? Were people staying? People were leaving. <laughs> um, and we were like, well, but we have free food. We have a game room. We have all these different things. Right? And, and they're like, you know, and then we realized quickly, like, oh, people stay because their voice is being heard. They stay because their contributions are being valued, because they're working on a project where they're learning and growing and contributing to the industry, making an impact. Right. There's yeah. like those are like good reasons why people stay. <laughs> um, and they just like the environment. It's a healthy team and healthy environment um it's not because of the food or you know the the free like nap rooms or the game rooms <laughs> you know stuff like that like that those things like they sound novel and cool at first but then even if you work at somewhere like Google with all the free food and stuff, um, I bet you anything, like, I know we see those TikToks of like the girls who that girl who, like spends all day, like just eating free food at Google and <laughs> enjoying her life and stuff. But actually it, people get kind of, after a while, it just kind of is your, you know, just normal for you. It's not like a, a super uh, exciting thing anymore. So, you know, so um, I would just say don't fall for the perks. <laughs> uh, how, like, how do you recommend people figure out if a company is right for them? You know, like, I love what you're saying about what drives satisfaction for people and like what what engages them. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you how do you think people can check that before they? Yeah. Um. You know, for me, I think the who is just as important as the what. Even at this time in my career, if I were to ever lose my job and like want to apply to jobs in the industry, um, and what I mean by that is kind of like, um. Yeah, a lot of people think about the what, right? Like how much salary is this going to be? What kind of job can I get, you know, make a lot of money or um, do something I love, you know, have be on a career path that I want. Like, let's say I want to work in marketing, right? So it's like more about what for a lot of people early on. But um, I would argue that also the who is very important. I know that's harder to kind of gauge. But um, one thing you can do is like interview your interviewer and uh, or at least observe your interviewer, right? Um, I've definitely had a lot of situations. I remember interviewing for, um, you know, internships at certain banks um, in certain companies where they the interviewer would look they just were pissed I mean they just looked like they were tired and angry and they hated their job and they you know they're like why are you here you know the, the way that they asked their questions were so like they just sounded like they just had a horrible attitude about life <laughs> And, and the thing is, like, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. <laughs> and, and that, you know, thinking that would have been me if I had accepted an offer with them, like, I, I would have had, you know, I would have been that person, right, a year from now interviewing and being angry and not liking my job. <laughs> um, and so so that was really important as well. And so, by the way, when it comes to a lot of times people, when they're, you know, even interviewing for Data Bento as a startup, um, a lot of times the concern is like, hey, you're a startup, like, are you going to fail? Are you going to succeed? Like, are you going to be okay? Right. I understand like, look, job stability for, for any company is very important. And it's a great question to ask. But at the same time, it's like, um, so what if we fail, right? It's like, if you learn something and you enjoy the work environment, you'll have a lot more doors open and available to you uh, compared to working at a large firm in a toxic environment. <laughs> um, you know, not that all large firms are toxic or anything, but just saying like um, that, you know, sometimes the startup, uh, despite the risk that's involved, um, could actually pay off pretty well, uh, even if the startup is on a you know trajectory towards failure. Um, you can still use that as a great stepping stone, which I don't I don't mind as a CEO. I'm like, great, you know, use it as a stepping stone for better opportunity. I think that's that's a good thing. Um, and so I would just mention it that way. I guess is like um, you know don't be discouraged from joining a startup just because it's small or just because the prospects of failure are a lot higher as a company overall. Because even by the time the startup fails, like you might be moving, you have moved on already to your next role. <laughs> you know, so like who knows. Right. Um, I wouldn't think about it as like a long term prospect kind of thing, um, but more on a daily basis. Like, so, yeah, more on a like micro daily basis kind of level. Like, are you going to enjoy that kind of work and are you going to learn a lot and enjoy the team you're on? Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to jump back to something I think you said really early in the conversation. Um, it was like a rhetorical question. You said, like, was I the right person to start this fund? And um, I have a bunch of questions about that, but I would I would love to uh, spend some time uh, just hearing, you know, what you think now. Like looking back, was that were, were you the right person to start uh, Dome Yard? It's a great question. I would say actually looking back, um, was I like the smartest person in the world and the best person to, uh, you know, best positioned, let's say, to start the fund? I guess the answer there would be definitely no. <laughs> uh, and that makes sense, right? Like um, it, between a student who has no experience whatsoever versus someone who already has 
a playbook on, and it's not necessarily a, an expert trader, by the way, that's a different skill set. Um, it's more like starting a company uh, involves a different type of, you know, you have to have a good playbook of like, um, what structure you want to be even like, what's your hedge fund structure? What kind of fee structure do you want? Um, who do you hire? Um, and actually, it's funny, because uh, there's recently, there's been some very large kind of hedge fund launches, for example. And even for us, I, you know, I look back, and like, I notice even they're hiring the wrong people. Uh, you, you know, they're started mm -hmm. by very experienced traders. Um, and, you know, very people with a lot of experience on the trading front but not on the business not on the startup front um and so yeah even that like you would you'd be expect them to be the right person to to start it um but actually i would say they would need a co-founder ideally who you know has that startup experience because that's a completely different experience than a different skill set i would say than um you know just being an expert quant <laughs> in the world and so um so yeah i'd say like you know, we, we are definitely not like they're existentially like not the right type of person to start the fund, but at the same time, um, having energy <laughs> in general, not something that's regardless of your experience, you know, you can still have be very much motivated to do something and to work hard. I mean, I would work late nights <laughs> and I still kind of do work late nights, but um, it's something that for me kept me up at night and woke me up in the morning. <laughs> and uh, and that for me was so long as that was there, um, then who cares whether or not I was, you know, the smartest or best person out there, you know, and th that's also how to realize and I think it's a good thing to know that hey I'm not the best person I'm not the smartest out there um, and also let's try to have a team you know people who are better than me at various skills <laughs> as well um, and so that helped a lot too but I think just it was overall a very humbling experience um, I know we didn't go much into the postmortem but also happy to maybe just briefly uh, talk about that too so yeah, yeah I think that'd be great to uh, to hear about yeah, for sure. Um, you know, postmortem wise, uh, basically in 2020, uh, we had a very bad year, um, which was really sad for me because I'm like, that should have been a good year for us. Um, for a lot of quant firms, they did very well. Uh, and for us, we were very we're struggling immensely. I think we ended the year at minus 12%. And it was our first time kind of doing that poorly. And uh, we were kind of, you know, scrambling to figure out what do we want to do. And uh, by the way, the funny part was actually, um, I remember at that at that time, um, our LPs, I believe almost all of them were highly, highly supportive. They were like, it's okay, it happens, <laughs> you know, you can yeah. survive, we'll, we'll stay yeah. with you, you know, um, but... I think for us by then, we had already kind of burnt out a little bit through, um, you know, a lot of the experiences that we had that went wrong, you know, being audited so many times, um, you know, hiring all the wrong administrators or the wrong kinds of service providers, like uh, all the principles that had gone wrong, wrong for us. Um, and uh, and then we also kind of were thinking is like, this was a time, it was pandemic was happening, it was time to take a step back and think about what do we really want to do in our careers and our lives. Um, and we realized like, look, this high frequency hedge fund is not scalable in nature. And we had known that for many yeah. years, but we were kind of in denial until like 2020 hit. And we Actually, were yeah, I, that was a question I always had is because there's an inverse relationship between like the yep. capacity, right? The, the yep. assets under management capacity and the frequency. Yep. So, you know, for all the reasons you said, high frequency is a great place to start because yep. you don't have a lot of capital and you get fast feedback. But um, not a great place to scale. Yeah, <laughs> um, we reached capacity. That was true as well. Um, and uh, to give you guys a sense, like even some of the top HFT firms teams, I would say in the world, because now they have to branch out of HFT to survive. Um, and that's some of the top HFT teams, like they would manage less than 100 million in assets. And that's why you never see a lot of the top HFT firms. They don't publish their AUM versus like a lot of hedge funds will. They'll say, hey, we manage 10 billion, <laughs> you know, right. but uh, HFT firms rarely do because when you find out how little they manage it's like what uh, and that, that's because we turn over our portfolio right we're trading twenty five thousand times a day our portfolio is turning over multiple times a day um but yeah you're right there's an inverse correlation right like then the higher your aum it's like um the lower your returns but also the less we kind of just do we don't have any capacity for yeah. what we're doing on the hft front um and we had known this for a while but we were kind of in denial about it because you know we were like we want to still grow and uh, you know we want to do this um but then when yeah then i guess when we had that bad year we kind of were able to step back and be like you, you're right you know where do we see ourselves in the next 10 years over you know this next decade um in the 2020s now and um realize like this is not going to grow you know <laughs> like we're not going to be able to unless we took the two sigma path of like hey let's do everything else now right let's start doing yeah. longer term mid frequency low frequency um you know two sigma i think they have a venture arm now they have a i'm sure they have probably like a pe you know a lot of them have like all kinds of stuff they do long only they do global macro like um they're able to kind of have a google moment of doing more than just one thing now they do kind of everything 
And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the technology infrastructure to do that, by the way. So yes, we had considered that. Let's become, let's do like low frequency strategies. Our, all, all of our tech, for better or worse, because we had built it, yes, we had all this IP. But then because we had built it, it was built only for one function, which was right. high frequency yeah. trading. Right. <laughs> so, so it was like a kind of double, I don't know what it's called. It's like one of those, um, hey, we, you know, that's kind of what we deserve. <laughs> we had, you know, taken this path and here we are. And so um, then it was kind of at the end of the day, we were like, okay, okay, well, let's sell whatever technology pieces we can at the end of the day. Um, and let's start thinking about other solutions, right? And so uh, other things we can do with our lives and, you know, just move on and, and shut down the fund. And, you know, and then we decided let's make this a completely separate company. A lot of people ask like, hey, why don't you just like, you know, change the name to Data Vento and just become a data vendor, right? Um, yeah. And and then I would uh, point to Sam Bankman Freed as Exhibit A on why you don't want to do that. Yep. <laughs> you never want to commingle like a hedge fund with uh, another kind of tech firm or anything like that. Um, and plus, by then, a uh, big reason for us, practically speaking, was our, our cap table was very crowded back then with all these early hedge fund investors that invested in a fund entity, not in a data yep. company. Um, totally separate. That's, that's a really important point. You know, you yep. have a syndicate you built around the first company with one set of goals and and one set of investment goals and, and criteria so yep you know a very different company you're probably gonna have a very different <laughs> yeah so so then uh, yeah we ended up shutting down the fund um and uh, the shutdown took a while too by the way because we had to liquidate the fund we had to do all the audits and financials and um wrap up everything you know figure out how much uh the in terms of when we did the dissolution, like how much each investor would get back and, you know, things like that. Um, very humbling experience, a very tough, lots of very tough phone calls and conversations with all of our various GP and LP investors. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of uh, very emotional calls for me. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and I, I think I really get like that emotional these days, but, but those were very emotional calls. We could just be like, hey, my, my company's failing, <laughs> you know, and this was like, it, you know, it was my baby. It was all I've known since I graduated from college, since college, essentially for the yeah. past decade you know that's all I've done was this one company that was all I've ever been you know if I was ever known for anything it would just be that you know um and so so it was tough to kind of let go even for myself like the identity of like being the founder of Dome Yard and that I you know that I kind of that's a really hard part of it you know your yeah. identity is so connected to your company especially your first company and you know you think about how much you're growing and maturing as a person in parallel um so yeah definitely uh feels like you're losing something yep exactly yeah um and so so then you know we had shut, we shut down um we all work out shutting down the fund actually the fund fully finally shut down in last year 2023 was like the year we we're finally able to close like the bank accounts and the books and everything so that was a long shutdown process <laughs> just as long as our launch i was like wow our <laughs> you know our launch and our failure took like three years time to kind of finish just each of those, which is interesting. So what's well, fascinating though now, I'm sure, I don't know about you. It's like, you, we feel like it's like, oh, we've been through the full life cycle of yeah. a business. Yeah. Um, and and that is an interesting uh, journey and experience. And so now I feel definitely feel a lot wiser from that. Um, you know, and then Jonathan went on to start his biotech firm that's doing very well. Um, and then me and Luca uh, continued working together on uh, Data Bento, which is a market data company. Um, and so it's just nice in that, you know, we can still kind of move on and do things. And then, by the way, many of our former, all of our former colleagues are all in really great spots today, I believe. So um, and most of them, you know, they would go on a lot of our quant researchers. They would go to work for um, like HRT, Citadel, Virtue, like those types of firms. So awesome. um, definitely... Yeah. You know, very proud that like that was the goal, right? Is um, and now for Data Bento as well, the same thing. We're like, hey, like whenever we hire someone, um, the goal was mainly like for you to just have a good career, no matter where you end up. <laughs> um, and so that I think that's a lesson we had learned the first time around is like, hey, you know, this is a journey, and um, some people will be with us, some people will leave, and that's okay. And just kind of enjoy that journey along the way. Um, I hate to say it, it's such a cliche thing, like oh, the best thing is the friendships you learned along, you know, <laughs> on the way, or whatever. But it's kind of true, right? Um, it's like uh, you know, the the end result whether it's success or failure um you know we ended up in pretty good places so i'm not too sad about that um i definitely think there's things we could have done better <laughs> absolutely over the sure. years um, so there's yeah. still lessons to be learned <laughs> yeah but that's 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 um that's a way to go through life right like you, it's like going through life knowing that you're always going to be making mistakes and learning right that's that's like uh, a path um that's super rewarding and taxing but um you know i think i think obviously like, you're so open to you know what's happened for you with your companies and and um you know turning it into you know the next company or the next idea you know i think i think it's awesome um 
I'm, I, I also like, I love a good story. And I feel like the story of, um, you know, starting Dome Yard because you wanted to have some control, like you didn't, you know, didn't find what you're looking for when you went to your internships and you kind of created it for yourself. I, I think that's like a really classic, um, you know, just entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurial spirit uh, kind of story. I love, I love the part of you living, living in the, they're living and coding uh, in the apartment, and, like only leaving to go to Shaw's for, for supplies. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I feel like that's the um, really invaluable part of starting your own thing, right? Is, is mm -hmm. uh, like all those experiences. And the other thing about companies, I feel like um, they're, because it's like a collection of people coming together just to do, do you know, to, to advance something, like to pursue some mission. I, I feel like um, keeping companies alive and, and running, whatever the outcome, um, you know, just, does good things for people because it creates these relationships. You know, you think about like you mentioned earlier, you learned so much about market microstructure and now you have a whole other company that's really kind of based on those learnings. It's amazing. Um, so that compounding just happens. Um, I think almost as like a side effect of a company pursuing a mission and like keeping at it. For sure. So. Yeah. You know, I think one thing I should always say since we're here is also just the, um, the Quantopian community was a huge part of the, you know, my journey as well as thousands of other people out there, um, their various journeys too. I mean, this was the first, for us, at least this is the first quant community, at least in Boston, I don't know about other areas, but in the Boston area, I mean, the meetups, we would go to the Quantopian meetups and, uh, and then when you guys started QuantCon, like the event as well. Right. And that was when, you know, we started meeting other people in the quant space. And and this is interesting, by the way, because there's there's retail quants and, you know, there's also yep. institutional quants. And back then, I think there weren't that many, you know, retail quants was kind of a newer thing as well. And so it's just nice to kind of meet those communities and, um, you know, and everything in between as well, of course, too. But yep. that was wonderful. Um, and definitely something that it's like almost like, you know, when Quantopian also, um, you know, when you guys uh, went away and you were started move you know, went on to Robinhood and stuff, I remember... Um, it almost like felt like there was a hole, you know, in the industry and that no one else has really been able to successfully plug that hole, um, you know, very well, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, and so, so that's been really fascinating, but um, it definitely it's like, you know, we're all kind of a part of hopefully this Quantopian legacy in a sense and, you know, still trying to build and companies that are, whether that we're catering to, like for us, we sell to a lot of quant firms yeah. um, or, you know, stuff like that as well. So there's definitely a lot of interesting lessons learned there. Um, but yeah, just really grateful to have you know been a part of that initial third generation if you want to call it or maybe fourth generation <laughs> I don't know but it's like we we're part of that initial generation of folks that are you know more of a community oriented um, quantitative firms that are started by people who you know maybe don't have that traditional background who didn't have um, you know generations of wealth or whatever it was uh to yeah. be able to you know like start a fund or whatever very easily um and it was in an era where hft was already there you know flash boys i remember uh, flash boys actually came out in 2014 which is um a few years after we had started working on our idea but it was still before we launched and so that did yeah. affect us but it was like flash boys did bring hft to the mainstream and yeah. because of that people knew more about what we were and so it's kind of like this era um that was happening so historically i think it was just interesting to witness this evolution of, of our space and general in the quant trading world and and where it is today too it's just so fascinating to see that so yeah i'm definitely grateful to have been you know part of that that journey for, for the past decade <laughs> i am so glad that you were part of the community that we were neighbors and i'm <laughs> i'm very grateful that you created uh dome yard and that uh you brought all these people together and um you know there's all all of these uh alumni dome yard alumni that are out there doing great things and that it led to uh, Data Bento, which I think is a super interesting company, which I think you'll have to come back and tell us about. Uh, yeah, for so sure. I'll let you know. You know, it, it could be a postmortem. It could be a success story. <laughs> who knows? Um, you know, we're still very, to give you guys a sense um, in case you're curious. So, so Data Bento, we're a market data provider, um, you know, providing market data primarily via API. So we're not like a terminal. We don't do charts or anything. Uh, just market data via API, live and historical, all kinds of you know, equities, futures, options, etc. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, we started it mainly, actually a couple of reasons. Of course, one was like, hey, we needed just somewhere to go and something to do. Uh, but two was like, actually, the data was the biggest challenge we faced at Dome Yard. Um, and that was one of the reasons we failed was because um, 
our data was our number one external expense that we had at Dome Yard. We were spending uh, millions of dollars, actually, which is very embarrassing to say, uh, millions of dollars on all kinds of data feeds and um, data vendors as well at the time, and just had a very frustrating experience working with these vendors. Um, and so decided, hey, let's start a company that can hopefully lower the barrier to entry. And, and that was the other thing. Like, we wanted to take our high frequency kind of knowledge, but also like use it to do good for the world a little bit because we were spent, we were an HFT firm for so many years. And people would always ask after Flash Boys came out, especially like, what good? do you do for the world and I would kind of like struggle a little bit grasping for straws like oh um, you know we hire a lot of people and give them jobs yes yeah. same with every company <laughs> right um, but um, you know yes we lower yes technically HFT firms do lower you know like the um, you know, if you think about today, you're trading, your prices are $0, right? It used to be like, I think it was like back then, I remember like $7 per trade. So like the, the cost of, um, you know, placing orders, stuff like that has lowered a lot because of all these market makers out there. So yes, um, there are some good things about the space that it's, it's created overall on like a macro level. Um, but I wanted to be like this company. I want to say like at this one company, Data Bento, what can we do better? Um, and what can we, you know, can we really like make a real impact now in our industry? Um, and so that's kind of what we're doing now is just, um, you know, we work with all kinds of companies, whether they're startups or very large. We do work with some of the largest um, HFT firms as well. And, um, you know, just as their data provider. <laughs> and, and that's about it. So, um, but yeah, in terms of that, we're still early stage. So that was what I was going to say is um, we, you know, we had raised like a Series A round of funding about like, I think two years ago. It's actually about time we raised another round, which is kind of scary for me. Who knows? And now the markets are crappy now. So I'm like, you know, we really don't know what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, we definitely are grateful for support of, um, we have, you know, quite a few registered users now and uh, over 2,000, I think. Uh, we oh, launched a year ago. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, so we went from zero to 2,000 in a year. So, you know, happy about that and um, happy to see the support from a lot of other startups in our space as well that are, whether they're doing charts, graphs, analytics, uh, fintech products, AI, you know, stuff like that. Um, and they're calling us their data backbone. And I really, really appreciate that too. So um, that's been a really fun journey. It's also been humbling because I've never been, I've never run a company that's like a service before like this, like a product. <laughs> um, so I've never had to sell something to somebody else um, and to, and that's really humbling because I'm used to being the hedge fund manager. <laughs> you know, I'm used to, like yelling at service providers and stuff and now um i've been in a situation where it's, where it's humbling where people yell at me <laughs> um and so so yeah that's been a very interesting journey so far um, but we're still very early it's still the beginning um you know i would never call ourselves a success story or anything like that you know it's very far too early for that but um yeah just uh, grateful at least to have those experiences from the hedge fund and be able to bring it into this uh, you know to bring it into data bento and to be like pretty confidently like here's how you build a data company <laughs> you know so that's been really good i feel definitely a lot more confident the second time around <laughs> that's awesome um well thank you so much i really i feel like i learned a lot in this conversation i love like how much energy you have for all the things that you've done and that you're doing it's like really fun to listen to you tell stories about um don't be all right i'm really excited about uh data about doing where you're going and i i hope we get to talk again yeah, thank you, Foss, for all you do, by the way. Um, I'm really grateful that you revived this Quantopian community here. Yeah, uh, I'm well, excited man, to see what so you end up doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just really ex excited to see what you end up doing with it as well. And definitely uh, excited to, you know, be be uh, back as a part of this, you know, really greater community in the quant space. So um, thank you, yeah, for all this too. <laughs> Thanks for seeing